All right, this morning we are looking at Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 9. It's, it's very full. Uh, I'd say that there's um, not only a rebuke in here, but there's also seven arguments of why they shouldn't listen to the Judaizers, but why, who are basically teaching you need to add circumcision and the keeping of the law, the Mosaic traditions, to believing in Christ. Christ isn't enough. He's going to give seven arguments why that isn't true. So it is, it is a full text, and, um, but I, I think we can get through it in, in the time that is allotted to us. So let's begin by reading the passage, Galatians 3, verses 1 through 9. Paul writes this, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Now, I, I, I hope you, you see here that, that Paul is, is not... I mean, okay, let me put it this way. This conclusion... Those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. It does really include everything we've seen. Sometimes it's hard to follow Paul's logic, okay? But there, are, there is a series of arguments, and all of these arguments, as I've told you already, are meant to show us that the blessings of God come through faith, through faith alone, not by our works, okay? So our works are out of the picture when it comes to acceptance with God. Now, what we need to do is... Um, sort of unpack this a little bit and see what it is that Paul is saying in each of these arguments because virtually every verse is a different argument. Now, last week, Paul, remember, was relating to the, to the Galatians, the arguments that he used against Peter. When Peter had at least temporarily adopted the position of the Judaizers, when Peter withdrew from eating with the Gentiles in the presence of the Jews who had been sent from James. So remember, Paul rebuked him. And in his rebuke, he gave him several arguments of why he was completely in the wrong and what he was saying through his behavior. He told him, first of all, and I'm going to just speak from Paul's perspective, we may be Jews and they may be Gentiles, Peter. But we know that the way of salvation is the same for both of us through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And why do we know that, Peter? Because we know no one ever has been or ever could be justified by the law. There are not two ways of salvation, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles, but only one way. And it's not through the law, okay? But again, that's what Peter was implying by his behavior. Secondly, if we agree with the Judaizers... If we, you know, begin to, to say that, okay, we need to be, um, go back to the old covenant system and we need to separate from the Gentiles and so forth, aren't we saying that Jesus isn't enough? Aren't we saying that we also need to add things to his work, which is circumcision and obedience to the law? And if that is true, aren't we saying that Jesus himself has actually led us astray because Jesus told us it is by trusting in him alone. And now we're siding with the Judaizers against him. We're saying that Jesus hasn't saved us. Aren't we saying that he's actually condemned us, that he is a minister of sin because we're following him and it's the wrong way? Well, Paul concludes that argument with this, there's just no way that's possible. It's impossible. It's impossible. 
And then thirdly, he said, if we say the Judaizers are right and we go back to the Mosaic traditions, haven't we also proven ourselves to be sinners because we left the traditions to, to hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ? So aren't we proving ourselves to be transgressors if we say the Judaizers are right? Well, yes, but we haven't transgressed. And then Paul went on to talk about where the misunderstanding is. He says the problem is the Judaizers misunderstand why God gave the law in the first place. He did not give it to us to be justified. It was to show us that we can't be good enough. It was to point us to Christ that we might trust in Him and die with Him to the law to be justified and or to be condemned. You know, in other words, our relationship with the law has changed. We are now dead to the law, but alive to Christ. The law cannot justify us. The law cannot condemn us. In Christ, he says, the old me has died with Christ, and a new me has been created when I was raised with him from the dead. Now, he says, I live not by the law to be justified, but I live out of love out of thankfulness to the Lord who first loved me and gave his life for me. So Paul says, far from rejecting or nullifying God's free gift of grace through Jesus Christ, he says, I glory in it. And he says, think about this lastly, Peter. If we could have earned our justification by keeping the law, what does that say about Jesus and his death? It means he died for nothing. And that cannot be. I think you see the point. If God is going to put his son through all that misery and on the cross, it can't be for nothing. And that's Paul's point. Now, I should say, this may conclude what Paul said to Peter, but he's not done arguing the point to the Galatians. So far from resting his case, he's going to continue to argue his point from several different angles, as I've said, all the way into chapter 5, at least. Now, this morning, we see seven more arguments that he gives to prove that justification must be by faith, received as a gift by faith. And it is not something we earn. We don't even add to it, okay? But as I've said, he begins with a rebuke. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, if you're thinking, okay, there's two words in here that should give you some measure of, of difficulty. First of all, Paul is calling them fools, <laughs> all right? And what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? If you say you fool to your brother, you're going to be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell, okay? So what's going on here? Well, first of all, um, he's not using the same word, and that doesn't come out very clearly in the English, does it? The word that Jesus uses in, in the Sermon on the Mount is <clears throat> the, the Greek word, Moros. Now, let me ask you, does that sound familiar? Okay, because that, that is the, the same Greek word that we get our English word moron from, okay? So you're not supposed to call your brother a moron out of anger, you know? That, okay, so that is a serious issue. The word that Paul is using here simply means without understanding, ignorant. And then the second word, bewitched, I mean, that kind of sounds problematic. Uh, is that witchcraft? Is he talking about you've been bedazzled by the enemy? Well, in a certain sense you have. But it simply means to beguile or to deceive. And so what he's saying is this, you're without understanding, Galatians, which is why you are so easily deceived. And that's also why Paul is attacking this issue from so many different perspectives. He wants to overwhelm them with the evidence the Judaizers are wrong, so they won't be without, you know, without understanding. I, I, I hope that we all see here the importance of truth, getting the truth, knowing the truth. That's the only defense that we have against the enemy's lies is God's truth. And this world is full of lies that are trying to ensnare us all the time. You know, we, those of us who are parents who have children who have walked away from the Lord, we know that. They've been captured by the world's lives. So our only defense against this is God's truth. We need to be grounded in the Word of God. And by the way, that's the reason why God has given to us what He has by way of means to equip ourselves. He's, he's, why He gives us the worship service 
and why He wants it full of His Word so that we will be equipped, we'll be grounded, we'll be instructed, we'll be discipled. That's what we're talking about, discipleship. That's why we also meet midweek to study the Word of God, why we read the Bible together year after year and meet together to discuss it, why we should be reading our Bibles and meditating on them and studying them and applying them. We need to know God's truth if we're to be safe. We need to apply it. It's not enough to know it. We have to do it. But, of course, we also need the Holy Spirit. And Paul will go on to talk about that as well. The Spirit of God has been given to us to love the Word. And when we yield to the Spirit, what we're actually doing is we're yielding to His leading us in the Word of God. This is the way. Walk in it. That's really the task of the Spirit. Besides comforting, He instructs us. But He instructs us through the Word and not just by subjective feelings. I think the Spirit wants me to do this today. I think He wants me to do that. that that's not the way we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. But the Spirit leads us in the Word and through the Word. The Word tells us everything we need to do. And the Spirit will bring that to our minds if it is in our minds. So we have to get it into our minds before the Spirit can really use it because He's not going to communicate information to us. He's going to take the information we have and lead us in it. So the truth, of course, again, that Paul is trying to argue that they're ignorant of, they seem to be ignorant of, so that they become deceived, is that justification is by grace through faith alone, apart from the works of the law. So now Paul goes on to give us seven more arguments, and don't get thrown off kilter by the length of the first one doesn't mean we're going to be here all day, okay? Now, first of all, and I'm going to do this in a series of questions that, that Paul is asking the Galatians. Think about this, okay? First of all, was Jesus Christ crucified or not? Okay, verse 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Now, Paul is not saying here that the Galatians saw it but they heard it. They knew that this had taken place. They, they knew it from him, from Paul. Paul had come and preached the gospel to them and had told them about what Jesus Christ had, had done. Most everybody in the Roman Empire didn't see what happened to Jesus, but they had heard about it through the preaching of Paul. He was still in the process of working his way through the Roman Empire, but word does get around of what was happening in Jerusalem, particularly among the Jews. But most importantly, I think Paul is appealing to his own eyewitness testimony. Remember what Peter said to Cornelius when he went to his household, that Jesus was revealed to those he had appointed as his witnesses, and it was their responsibility to testify to everyone that Jesus was crucified and he was raised from the dead, and there is salvation only by trusting in him. So he was publicly portrayed as crucified, and they knew that. But why was he crucified? Well, Paul already told us, because God had a plan to save. No one can be saved through their works. Jesus had to live, and he had to die if any of them were to be saved, which means, of course, that if Jesus died on the cross, it could not come from works. It could not be in the way of the Judaizers. It had to be through the way of faith. Otherwise, Jesus died for nothing. But you know he died, so you know it wasn't for nothing, so you know it must be by faith. Okay, I hope, I hope you see that point. So that was his first argument. Second argument, he says, how did you receive the Spirit? Verse 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, if we think through this, clearly it was not through the works of the law, okay? Now, the Galatians were Gentiles, uh, converted on Paul's first missionary journey. And when you read about that journey, there were some of these cities that had Jewish synagogues in them. And there were some of the cities which there's no mention of a Jewish synagogue, but there is mention of pagan worship. Now, those that lived in those cities that had established synagogues, and that would be Pisidian Antioch and Iconium. 
They had the influence of the Jews. They knew something about the law. Some of these may have even been God-fearers, which means they were partway converts to Judaism. But they didn't receive the Spirit through them, okay? By listening to the Jews or by going to the synagogue, uh, but rather by hearing the gospel, okay? And some of them, as I said, did not appear to have any Jewish influence. Those in Lystra and Derbe, those are the ones that when they saw Paul, doing in, um, Paul and Barnabas doing miracles, they, they called for sacrifices to be sacrificed to them. Uh, the, the priest of Zeus comes out, and, and Paul and Barnabas run out and say, don't do this, you know, we're just men, but worship God. We're, we're here to tell you you need to turn away from these false gods. They don't seem to even have had the Jewish influence, okay? So how, how did they receive the Holy Spirit? Well, it certainly wasn't through the law or through works because they didn't receive the Spirit. They didn't have the Jewish influence. All they had was a pagan influence, and they certainly didn't receive the Spirit by worshiping Zeus, Okay. They received it by hearing the gospel with faith. As they listened to Paul preach the gospel of God's free grace, the Spirit of God raised them to spiritual life. They believed, and they were saved. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's a bit unclear what Paul means here by receiving the Spirit. Okay? He could be referring to the work of regeneration, the new birth, where you're dead, but the Spirit makes you alive, as Jesus you know, said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Or he could be referring to that sign that they had received the Spirit. We read about the case of Cornelius and his household. There was also the case of the Samaritans. Remember, they didn't receive the Spirit until the apostles came down and laid hands on them, and then Simon the magician wanted to buy that ability and so forth. The disciples of John the Baptist that uh, Paul runs into at Ephesus. We haven't even heard that there's a spirit. Well, what were you baptized into? Baptism of John. Well, you haven't even heard about Jesus Christ? Well, let me tell you about him. And so he tells them and then lays hands on them and they receive the spirit of God. So that sign that Paul and the apostles, Peter as well, saw that they had, were receiving the spirit was that gift of speaking in tongues, which was only given when an apostle was present. That, that's something that we need to note. In order to tie all these believers that were coming from all these different ethnicities, okay, from Samaritans and from the Gentiles, to tie them all together under a common faith, which at that time was centralized in two different places, in Jerusalem, which was the center of Jewish Christianity, and Antioch, which was the center of Gentile Christianity. So there had to be representatives from those churches present before this gift was given to keep everybody, as it were, tied to them until God establishes His church. But the point is, there was something that they experienced, something that, that they did, something the apostles could see to show that they had received it, so the Spirit and, and you know, that particular gift. So, is that what Paul was referring to? Or was he referring to both? Uh, probably both, okay? Because the Spirit does work through the preaching of the gospel to bring new life. And he also gives, in those days, the gift of tongues through the same gospel. And, and I mentioned that we don't believe that he still gives that gift today. That's really a topic for another day. But the point is, they receive the Spirit both ways, <laughs> through faith and not through their works. Now, as I was thinking about this, it raised an interesting question. And I've already addressed it. You've heard me address it a million times, but we need to think about this. Is the new birth, is regeneration, the spirits, you know, raising us from spiritual death to spiritual life, is, does this create some kind of experience that we can know that we have received him? And, you know, what do you think the biblical answer to that question is? <laughs> you know, yes. There's a big difference between being a dead sinner and being a living saint. Okay, there is a big difference, and the Bible does talk about that difference. And many differences, actually, that we call the marks of grace, and we're all familiar with those marks of grace. And those things can all be boiled down to one word, as you've heard me say in the past, and that is love. Love. 
We once hated God. We once hated Jesus. We once hated His words, His worship, and His people. We may not have been irate or angry against these things, but we didn't have a taste for it, and we, we stayed away from it because we didn't want it. But now we love these things, and, and those are the things that draw us to Him. And we love them because they all share God's character, that, that which makes Him beautiful, which is His moral perfection and His holiness. That's what we love about Him, and that's what draws us into these different things that, that we talked about before by which God actually makes us more holy, by which the Spirit of God works through these things. So yes, there is an experience, okay, that we should experience. And it doesn't mean we become perfect overnight or super zealous because once we become alive, what we experience really depends a lot on what we do. Whether we plunge ourselves back into the world, separate ourselves from the things that God uses to draw us near to Him, we need to, to dive in, as it were, to those things that we know He desires of us, and then we'll see that love growing and we'll see ourselves zealous as we, well, as the Bible says we should be, for God's glory. So the Spirit through Paul is asking us this morning, first of all, has this change come in our lives? And if so, how did it come about? You know, is it something we did? You know, we worked our way to this experience through our efforts, or did we hear the gospel? And by God's grace through His Spirit, were we raised to life and we believed? Well, again, the point to us is it came through faith, not through works. All right. So now thirdly, having received the Spirit by faith in Christ, and so the ability to trust Him and receive this justification, okay, that uh, comes by His perfect righteousness alone, the next question is this. Will you now, Galatians, or will we turn back to the law in order to complete this justification? Now, I don't think Paul here is arguing in this next verse sanctification. I think he's arguing justification still. And I trust we all see the difference between those two things, you know, how you're accepted by God versus how He wants you to live, okay? But listen, verse 3, are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So he's using that same word again, you know, foolish. Are you foolish and are you without understanding? Don't you see? You couldn't be justified by the law. That's why God sent His Son to die for you. You couldn't even believe, which is why He gave you the Spirit, which comes through the preaching of the gospel. Will you now turn away from those things back to the law to finish or complete that which has already been completed in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus gives to us a, a perfect package, you know, the whole package. It's perfection that we cannot add to. So are we going to try turn away from that perfection and turn to our imperfect works to try to make His work perfect? He says to do that would again be to deny everything that Jesus did. And to say that he came from, for nothing. Remember, for Paul, it's an all or nothing, isn't it? Okay? If you're going to turn it all to works, then you're saying Christ came for nothing. It's not just all works, then Christ came for nothing. We, we have to make sure that we stay away from adding any works. Now, fourthly, Paul asks this, why did you go through all that suffering? In verse 4, did you suffer so many things in vain for nothing? You know, if indeed it was in vain or for nothing. Paul here is likely referring to the persecution that these Gentile believers had to endure from their Jewish neighbors for receiving Christ. You know, the Jews did not just persecute Jews who received Christ. They persecuted everyone that received or embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. So they suffered. Paul is saying, did you suffer all these things for nothing? Was it all for nothing? I mean, wasn't it because you believed so strongly that Christ was sent from God, that He was your only hope? You embraced Him and you were willing to suffer for Him. Realize, Galatians, that if you now accept what the Judaizers are teaching you, what you're saying is that obedience to the Mosaic tradition is the way of acceptance with God, 
And if that's true, then all that suffering you did, you did for absolutely no reason. It was for nothing. You, you just wasted your time and you went through all that suffering for no good reason. Now, the same thing, you know, the author to the Hebrews argues the same thing in the book of Hebrews, but the same thing would be true for us if we were, if we ever turn away from the Lord. If we have been persecuted for following the Lord because we love Him and we're actually doing what He calls us to do. And by the way, does the, what does the Bible say is going to happen to us if we love the Lord and we follow Him? You know, I, and I smile, but it's, it's, not, it's not fun necessarily, but we're going to suffer. Um, if we turn away from Christ now in our lives, like they were doing, to works, or if we begin to trust in our own works or add things to, to Christ, then we're saying the same thing. All of our suffering was for nothing. I mean, these these Galatians could have just become converts to Judaism and they would have escaped all the suffering, which is what the Judaizers are trying to do. They're trying to bring the, the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles back to Judaism. But it means it's all for nothing. But let me just leave us with this encouragement. Jesus tells us whatever we suffer for Him is not for nothing. He promises a reward, a blessing upon those who suffer. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 I don't know how often you read the Sermon on the Mount, but it's something we ought to read more often. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that's one of the ways you know the kingdom of heaven belongs to you is that you've been persecuted for living the way Christ calls you to live. Then he goes on to say, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because you follow this leader, that leader, or this religion, or this particular set of rules. No. But because of me, he says, because you're following him, not because you're following some charismatic leader and, and his wacky way of looking at things, okay? I mean, that happens. People suffer for a variety of reasons today. Not all suffering is suffering for Christ, but if you love Christ and you're following Christ and you suffer for him, then you are blessed. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Sounds good to me. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, suffering is not for nothing. Christ will reward us for everything we have had to go through. And he even says that, that those who suffer in this way will have a great reward in heaven. Okay, well, Paul isn't done. Next question is this. What about the miracles that the Lord performed among you? Was it the preachers of the law who did these miracles, or was it a preacher of grace? So in verse 5, he says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit, he's already used that argument, and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, Paul already addressed the, you know, he, he provides the Spirit through, through the gospel. But here he wants to add something more. What about the miracles that they had seen? Now, Paul is not saying here, as some might in, in charismatic circles teach today, he's not even implying here that, that these believers were all doing miracles. Okay, you, you know, you Galatians are doing these miracles. Where did they come from? Not every believer could do miracles. God gave the ability to do this only to his messengers to confirm that the word they were speaking came from him. So what Paul is asking here is this, whose message did God confirm through miracles? Was it the message of the Judaizers or was it the message that he brought to them through the gospel? Well, the Judaizers, we, have no, we read nowhere in Scripture that they were able to do any kind of miracles at all. Okay? God was not endorsing their message. By the way, God would not, He would never endorse a false gospel. And just think about that as far as the people claiming to do miracles today. Is their message from God? That's one way you can, you know, you can tell. If what they're preaching is, is flat-out contradictory to Scripture, those miracles are also not miracles from God, okay? So this is what Paul is saying. 
God confirmed the message Paul brought to them through miracles, and that's why they should listen to him. And also, as we're thinking about the apologetic argument, let's not forget, God has confirmed his gospel to us through miracles, just not miracles we're doing today, but the miracles that they did back then, okay? Those are the miracles God used to confirm that the message they were speaking was from him. Remember R.C. Sproul's argument for the Bible being the Word of God? Uh, eyewitness, we have eyewitness accounts of Jesus doing miracles, which means God was attesting that this is a true prophet. Jesus says the Bible is the Word of God, okay? So God shows us this is his messenger. His messenger says this is his Word, okay? So that's why we believe, one of the reasons we believe, that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, sixth, how was Abraham? The great Old Testament example, the great Old Testament paradigm of justification by grace through faith alone, how was he justified? You know, that was important even for Gentiles, right? Because Abraham is the first Jew, so to speak. But he is the father not only of believing Jews, but also of believing Gentiles. You're all believing Jews, you're all believing Gentiles. I'm just kidding, but all right. But he is the father of all who trust in him. So Paul points to Abraham, whether the audience is Jew or Gentile. Verse 6, even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. I told you earlier, he was justified by faith. He believed God. He believed that promise that God would give him as many children as the stars in the heaven, but not just physical children, also spiritual children through the particular seed, that one seed that he promised, through whom all the nations would be blessed, Jesus Christ, and Abraham looked forward to him, he trusted him, and he was justified, okay? How do we know that? Jesus says in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How did you see Abraham, right, is what the Jews were asking. You're not yet 50 years old. Abraham lived a long time ago. How did he see you? Well, the way that he saw him was, of course, well, before Abraham was born, I am. But he saw him through the types and the shadows and the promises. He saw Christ when God made that promise on Mount Moriah when he spared his son. And he says, God will provide for himself. Actually, he says, literally, God will provide himself a sacrifice. He knew about Christ, and Jesus said, he saw me, and he was glad, which means he trusted in him and rejoiced because he was saved through him. So if we would be justified, Paul is saying, if we would be God's children, we must also trust in Jesus. Therefore, he says in verse 7, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham, not those who are sons of the law. And then finally and briefly, what did God promise Abraham with regard to the Gentiles? Verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. God was promising to Abraham even way back then that he was going to send the good news of his son to all the nations that they might also know this blessing of justification by grace through faith alone and with it eternal life. So if the Galatians would know this blessing based upon that text, you see, they have to trust in Christ. He says in verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So if we have trusted in Jesus Christ alone, we have this blessing. What is the blessing? Christ's righteousness, His forgiveness, justification through His righteousness and His forgiveness, preservation, we are going to make it all the way to the end, and eventual glorification. It, this all comes through hearing with faith by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have trusted Him, 
These things belong to us. The blessing of Abraham has come to us. We have it by faith. We know because God is true to his word. If we love him and we're trusting Christ, these blessings belong to us. How do we know we love him? Well, we're going to see more about that as Paul unfolds. That's what sanctification is all about. All sanctification is the outworking of that love towards him. It changes our lives. But let me just close by saying this. If, if we haven't trusted Jesus, this is the only way that we're ever going to receive the blessings that he gives to us. Okay? It, it can't be by our works. We cannot work our way into God's favor. We can never be good enough. We can never do enough. We can only receive it. Receive his favor as a free gift of his grace. And he gives it to all who will come and trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with uh, that in mind, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to um, help us to search our hearts. Because as we prepare to come to the table... We do need to remember the table is for those who have received Christ, who do love him, who are trusting in him, who are bearing those fruits of his grace. If that isn't true of us, we shouldn't come. But if it is true of us, we should come because here the Lord will meet with us. He will minister to us. The Spirit of God will minister to us. So he will strengthen us. He will feed us. He will nurture grace in our souls and make us love him more, which is what we want. Well, let's pray.